change. Change is constant and change is ubiquitous. Change, it stops for no one individual, organization, or technology. And this really holds true when it comes to security and compliance. And at AWS, we lean into this change. I'm Samara Moore, and I'm really passionate about security and resilience for our regulated industries. In fact, this is something that I've worked on for the last 20 plus years. And I lead a team of experts that are also just as excited about understanding those regulatory requirements that you have to follow where you operate. But also, we work with teams across AWS to provide services and solutions and resources to help our customers meet your assurance needs. How many of you are familiar with the concept of day one? Okay, a few of you. At AWS, this is particularly relevant when we're talking about navigating regulatory changes. Our founder, Jeff Bezos, described the concept of day one in the 2016 shareholder letter, where it talked about four ways that we work to stay day one at Amazon. The first is related to being customer obsessed, and we're unusually customer obsessed. And in this case, we look to really focus on delighting our customers. The second is around avoiding proxies. And this is where we focus on outcomes and really understanding the needs of our customers. Third, we look at embracing external trends. And for this talk, let's think about that in the context of adjusting to regulatory changes in a very customer obsessed way. And then lastly, it's around making high velocity decisions. We are really focused on helping our customers adjust to regulatory changes. And we're doing this by listening to our customers, seeking to understand their needs and innovating to help them meet their security assurance needs. Across the world, customers in very highly regulated industries are using cloud services even for their most critical functions. Now, I have a few examples to share with you here, and these are from healthcare, which is highly regulated, financial services, highly regulated, and energy, which is also highly regulated. So we'll start with an example from financial services. NASDAQ, in December of 2022, completed migration of the first US options market to a cloud service provider, to cloud technology on AWS. Their press release noted that this new system achieves their high standards for resilience and performance while also meeting their very exacting standards for regulatory compliance. Another example I'll point out to you is within the healthcare and life sciences industry, and that's Moderna. Moderna is a biotech company that's pioneering a new class of messenger RNA medicines. Moderna has to follow healthcare and life sciences requirements. And those requirements include requirements for record keeping, and GXP requirements. Now, if you're not familiar with GXP, that stands for good manufacturing practices, good laboratory practices, and good clinical practices. And these are guidelines which really focus on quality management systems and security management systems. Again, Moderna is able to do this using AWS services in a way that meets their security and compliance requirements. For our last example, I'll take you to the energy sector. Vector is a company in Australia and New Zealand that is leveraging cloud-enabled IoT, machine learning, and big data analytics to help them 
have more efficient grid management processes as well as integrate clean energy resources. Again, they are able to do this while meeting their security and reliability requirements, but also enabling their customers access to more clean energy resources. So these are just a few examples for you of how customers in these highly regulated industries are using cloud services for more and more critical functions. So next, we're going to talk about a few shifts in the regulatory environment and how AWS helps customers to navigate these changes. First, security guidance, regulation, and standards are becoming more cloud aware. And what I mean by the term cloud aware is that we're seeing in these regulation standards and guidance documents references to cloud specifically in some cases. And in other cases, we're seeing references to third party service providers. So we'll talk about where we're seeing that and what that means. We're also seeing that customers are having increased due diligence needs as well as in increased need for deeper levels of security assurance. And we'll talk about what we're doing to support you, our customers, in that area. And lastly, we're seeing a global shift around operational resilience. And we'll go into some ways in which we help our customers navigate the needs for increased operational resilience. But all of these are showing a trend towards increased oversight for use of cloud services. Over the last three years, we've seen a shift in government and customer expectations around re and regulatory approaches around use of cloud services. And we see this in strategies that are published. We see this in new and proposed rulemaking. And we also see this in public-private engagement. So here are just a few examples of where we're seeing this around the world. Starting off with strategies, earlier this year in March, the US released its national cyber strategy. And in that strategy, it referenced cloud services as part of modernizing the federal government systems so that they can take advantage of increased security and resilience for provision of digital services. That strategy also included plans to drive cloud security requirements. In Australia, the Digital Transformation Agency's secure cloud strategy identifies building blocks so that agencies can use the cloud in a secure way. In that strategy, it also adjusts three myths to use of cloud services around security, the ability to meet security requirements, the ability to meet privacy requirements, and the ability to meet record retention requirements. So we'll move on and talk about regulations or proposed rules. And for that, we'll talk about some examples in Europe and in UK. In Europe, the NIS2 directive, it expands on the previous cybersecurity rules from 2016. And it expands to additional sectors such as energy and transport, water, banking, and digital infrastructure, and healthcare. In particular, it includes digital service providers and includes additional requirements for security and notification requirements that are included in the directive. Another example is the Digital Operational Resilience Act, known as DORA. How many of you are familiar with DORA? Yeah, I, I expected so. DORA, it, it went into effect or it was published in December of 2022 and it includes new requirements for third party providers as well as financial institutions. And it includes security risk management requirements, incident reporting, resilience testing framework, and an oversight framework for digital service providers. 
The other one I'll reference, and this is around um, proposals for rules, is in the UK. In July of 2022, there was a joint paper issued by three regulatory authorities around operational resilience and critical third parties to the UK financial sector. In this paper, it details proposals for minimum resilience standards, resilience testing, and the oversight of critical third parties. The last one I'll highlight is where we're seeing this shift or increased focus from public-private partnership and public-private engagements. For this one, we'll go to Singapore. In Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore had a cloud services form, and it's focused on resilience. And this is focused on engagement between regulators and cloud service providers to exchange views on security risk management practices. Some key takeaways of that were the increased use of public cloud by financial institutions, the role that cloud service providers play in operational resilience, and the need for information sharing. So these are just some examples to illustrate some of the shifts that we're seeing. So we're not just standing by and watching this happen. We are actively engaged. I mentioned earlier that I lead a team of global experts that are passionate about this, that are engaged around the world where we operate. And it's not just my team. We have multiple teams that are working to understand those policies and requirements, regulations, and guidelines, and standards that impact our customers and their ability to use cloud services. We are engaged in, uh, with over 300 regulatory authorities or standards bodies. And we're really engaged in two ways. One, to understand and evaluate policies, and two, to share our approach and resources. So to understand and evaluate policies, we work to understand those local region specific, country specific, or even industry specific policies and do impact assessments and impact analysis to understand how our customers are impacted and then to provide guidance or resources to help our customers adapt to those changes. In particular, right now we're evaluating over 200 different regulations, rules, guidance, or standards that could impact our customers. That's part of our process. Next, to share our approach, we engage with our customers directly. We respond to requests for compliance information. We also engage with auditors as they are examining AWS to share about our controls and our environment. And we engage with regulators to help them understand how our customers use our services. What this does is it helps facilitate an open dialogue and a framework for feedback. We believe that it's that feedback, that opportunity for us to learn from each other that helps rules be established for cloud services that help us to really take advantage of the security and resilience of cloud services. So an important part of navigating through these changes that we see in the regulatory environment is understanding how these requirements are addressed by your third, third party service provider. To adjust to the shift now of due diligence, I'm gonna to talk to you about another Amazonian concept called the flywheel. And it helps to understand how, us to understand how these changes impact our customers, but also how we learn, take that in, and then produce more services to help support you. The flywheel concept comes from a book called Good to Great from Jim Collins, and it describes a process around a central flywheel that's caused to spin. 
Now, it's important to note that this flywheel doesn't just spin on its own. It takes considerable effort. And it also takes multiple, in this case, we'll say multiple processes, but multiple efforts to really get, get, get it going and to gain momentum. Once spinning, though, that flywheel energizes outcomes that contributes to the cycle. So we'll talk about how we use this Amazonian concept and a key part of our culture to how we support customers with meeting their due diligence needs. We're focused on helping our customers to reach their compliance outcomes. That's really the heart of it. We start by listening to our customers' assurance needs and understanding what they need to comply to or how they might need to comply. We take what we've heard, we really seek to understand, and then we take that back internal and work with teams across AWS to be able to innovate and find ways to meet those needs. One of the main ways that we meet those needs is through providing assurance to global standards and certifications. You'll see here that we provide 143 global standards and certifications. These certifications benefit all of our customers, regardless of what the certification is. And what informs which cert standards or certifications we pursue is really driven by the needs of our customers. So let me give you an example of that. The ISO standard 22301 on business continuity is one that we recently obtained based on what we heard from our customers around their needs for a greater assurance around operational resiliency. Again, we'll talk more about that later. Another way we help our customers meet their assurance needs is through security services and capabilities that we make available. We offer over 300 security services and features that support security, compliance, and governance. A few examples of those are AWS Config, AWS Audit Manager, and Security Hub. And they have API-enabled preventative and detective controls that help our customers meet their, the most common security frameworks. Next, we work on iterating to help enable our customers. One of the ways in which we help enable our customers is through providing resources, again, specific to those region and country and industry specific needs that they may have. Our customers also have access to experts in the field, and these are experts that are just as passionate and that have a lot of experience in either the region specific or the industry specific requirements or frameworks that you're trying to follow. And you can get access to them through your account manager and they can plug you in both to the compliance specialist as well as to the resources that are available. A third way that we help, help, help enable our customers is through third parties that have services that are deeply integrated to AWS. We have thousands of services available to help support security, resilience, and compliance. All of this, as I mentioned earlier, are ways that we iterate. It doesn't happen overnight. And these things work in concert. So we hear from our customers. We take in what we learn. We offer new services. We hear back. And we continue to iterate and improve how we support our customers. Now, we talked earlier about how our customers are using the cloud increasingly for more critical workloads. Well, regulators are also evolving. And what we've heard from our customers is that our customers want us to be engaged in these processes with them. So to do that, we engage directly through our customers through a number of ways. We do deep dives on security topics through summits 
or one-on-one -on -one sessions when needed. But we also engage in tabletop exercises. Additionally, we engage in open regulatory processes or standards development processes where appropriate to support our customers. So we can submit comments to request for comments or request for information or participate in open working groups. Now, we've talked about this cycle, and this is the general cycle, but I'd like to take a step and go a bit deeper, focusing on some due diligence activities. As I mentioned before, we listen to our customers, and we really do. And once we hear what our customers need, we take and we iterate on that. So I want to tell you a few things that we listened to, we heard, and then we delivered. So we listen to our customers' due diligence needs and learn that you want to have one place to find assurance information. So we released AWS Artifact. AWS Artifact is available for all of our customers, and it's an on-demand resource that you can go to to find reports from independent assessments and audits that have been done on AWS, as well as other useful security documentation. One example of other documentation would be the Cloud Security Alliance questionnaire. That questionnaire includes common questions that we hear from customers around use of cloud services and provides AWS responses in a way that's aligned with our shared responsibility model. We've also heard from customers that it can be complicated to understand which regulations may apply to you and how AWS can help you meet those requirements. So there are a few different resources that we've put out there to help address this need. I'll start with one that's focused on the financial sector industry, and that's AWS Compliance Center. So AWS Compliance Center is available on our public website, and it allows customers to do research on regulations that apply to them by region and by country. Right now, there are currently 72 summaries available for our customers to reach out, reach out and look up around financial services. And this is another area where we're always innovating. So we're always adding more content based on the needs of our customers. Now, while AWS Compliance Center is focused on the financial services industry, we do have other resources and, again, continue to build this out based on the needs of our customers. For example, if you go to other industry pages on our site, such as for healthcare and life sciences, you can find a white paper related to those GXP practices that I was discussing earlier. We also have an AWS security library with a technical content library where you can find more user guides that have useful information for common frameworks and how AWS can help you meet those requirements. So another area that we heard from our customers, we heard that customers want to be able to adjust to auditing on AWS. So we have the AWS Cloud Audit Academy. The AWS Cloud Audit Academy is a security learning path with, that teaches you how to audit on AWS. And it has training at three different levels, the, starting with basics around just cloud security and auditing cloud services. And it's not specific to any vendor, but really covers key security practices and auditing in the cloud. But then it goes more specific with training on resources and auditing specific to AWS or to some industries or particular standards. The last area I highlight is where we heard from customers that want to better manage more audits with faster cycles. And for that, we issued, and this was just last year, we released the Digital Audit Symposium. 
Now this is for our customers that have contractual audit rights. But what this provides for our customers are really four main things that I'll touch on. One, a compliance briefing where our customers can hear about common questions we get asked around auditing on AWS. Second, instructional videos around our security domains and how we implement those security objectives. Third, and again, this is for customers with contractual audit rights, there's access to evidence packages so you can dive deeper and better understand how the AWS implements controls. And then the fourth one, which is particularly innovative, is our virtual data center tour. And this is where customers can double click on security controls and learn more about security controls within the data center. But also, customers have access to data center security experts and can ask questions and learn more about a specific question they may have around data center security. So I've talked about a few different things, and in particular, we wanted to give you a glimpse into how some of the concepts that are key to our culture really help us to stay on top and understand what our customers' needs by continually seeking and listening, and then applying that internally. In particular, the flywheel concept allows us to align to our customers' assurance needs. As some takeaways, I really encourage you to leverage the AWS resources that are available to you. I encourage you to reach out to your account manager to learn more about how to get access to those resources or to those compliance specialists that, again, are experts in your regional, country, or industry-specific areas. We know that these things are always changing, so it's important for us to continue to iterate, to continue to listen and connect with you, and to continue to learn. The takeaway I want you to get from my part of this is that we're constantly investing in supporting you, our customers, in your assurance needs. Now, we're gonna go deeper next into operational resilience. And to do that, I'm going to pass it to Russell Lewis, uh, my colleague. Now, Russell is one of these compliance experts I've referred to several times. Russell comes from the financial services industry, and I've had the privilege of working with Russell, and our teams have worked together to support several of the things that I just described earlier. So, Russell? All right, thank you, Samara, appreciate it. Now, Samara started with a theme of change. But one thing that doesn't change is that regulators fully expect their regulated entity to be responsible for meeting their compliance objectives. And that's true if they decide to outsource to a third party. My name's Russell Lewis. I'm a member of our financial services industry specialist team. And I work with customers on a day in and day out basis to help them move their most sensitive and regulated workloads to AWS. To give you a feel for how our team operates, we start by working across our set of global compliance specialists to work backwards from the specific compliance needs that our customers have. And then we work with them to understand if they're able to meet their compliance objectives in the cloud. Now keep in mind that a lot of these customers already have existing compliance frameworks. They have deep governance processes, control frameworks, and our team is really responsible for helping them pivot and optimize those for the cloud model. And customers are not shy about telling us about some feedback and some of the challenges or questions that they may have here. So we take that feedback and a lot of our time is spent actually feeding that back through to internal teams, like Samara's team in, in Security Assurance. We also feed that back to legal and to our service teams. And this really just helps overall raise the bar in 
all customers' ability to meet their compliance objectives. So one question that's come up quite a bit recently is on operational resilience. And for our purposes, we're going to define operational resilience as the ability of our customers to prevent, detect, respond to, recover from, and ultimately learn from operational disruptions. So let's dig in. Now, this trend really started uh, several years ago, but what we've seen is an acceleration over the past few years. In March 2021, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision issued principles for operational resilience. And these principles include concepts like governance, operational risk management, business continuity planning, and testing, as well as third-party dependency mapping, just to name a few. And what we're seeing is an acceleration really starting in Europe and the UK. So in the UK, the Prudential Regulatory Authority, the Financial Conduct Authority, and the Bank of England are all deeply considering these principles. And the Digital Operational Resilience Act in the European Union is also deeply considering these principles. In Japan, the Financial Services Agency, or the JFSA, recently released a discussion paper on operational resilience. And these also consider these Basel principles. And right here at home in the US, the federal banking agencies released a practice, a, a sound practices on strengthening operational resilience paper in 2020, a little before we saw this acceleration. And more recently, the SEC has released updates to their regulation systems compliance and integrity, which is a rule to help promote fair and orderly capital markets. And as you can see, this is truly a global trend. Now, my team and I have the honor of working with senior management teams and customers around the world. And what we've heard from them is that they have to be able to explain their approach to operational resilience to a wide variety of stakeholders. And these could include their internal risk management functions, their board, their audit teams, and certainly their regulators. And if there's one key takeaway today that I'd like you to, to part with, it's that you have to be able to explain your operational resilience approach end to end, and that includes your use of third parties like cloud service providers. Now, we've come up with a helpful mental model that might be useful as you explain your approach here. And this looks at impact and time of a potential disruption. This bottom line, or your service levels, are how you design for your normal operations and your normal recovery. And think of these scenarios as relatively minor types of disruptions, like a misconfiguration of a server or maybe a spike in network traffic. AWS can help with the, uh, concepts like auto-scaling and auto-remediation. But the key here, again, is to be able to map and respond, or sorry, map and be able to explain this to your, your customer or to your regulators. Now, for a more severe type of business disruption, you might enact your continuity plan. And this is for a scenario like, uh, for example, a cyber event causing you to recover data from a cyber vault. And this top line here, this impact tolerance, this is a very important line. This is the line that you agree to with your regulators, your risk management stakeholders, and your customers, that even under severe but plausible scenarios, you cannot cross that line. And this is the line that you just simply cannot risk accept beyond that point. And so a scenario here that, might, uh, that you might want to consider is a widespread natural disaster that ha you have to relocate your people. And so what we've heard from customers is that they're, the easiest way they can explain their approach to operational resilience is to start with a set of scenarios and work backwards from those. So be able to identify those and communicate them. And keep in mind that you may already have scenarios that you, their regulators are familiar with to start with. But we've heard feedback from customers that they want to understand more deeply some of the scenarios to consider on the AWS side. 
So we've released the AWS fault isolation boundary white paper at the end of last year to help you understand some of the natural fault isolations that we bake into our infrastructure and our services. Now it's important to remember that customers are responsible for building resilient applications in the cloud, while AWS is responsible for building resilience into the cloud or of the cloud. And so being able to describe the infrastructure to a wide variety of stakeholders is deeply important here. So being able to describe how a region is a physical location in the world that compri comprises three or more availability zones. And that those availability zones are very purposefully spaced out, close enough together to facilitate synchronous replication, but far enough apart to reduce the likelihood of being simultaneously impacted by a shared fate scenario, like a flood or utility power outage. But it's important not only to understand the infrastructure, but also to understand the way our services are designed to be resilient and our culture. So in our service design, with a few exceptions, a service in one region is isolated from that same service in another region. And just as we advise our customers to design across multiple availability zones, we build our services in a similar way. And this allows for scenarios like a degradation or an impairment, partial or full impairment of a particular availability zone to keep the overall health of the service up. And then we separate out the control plane and the data plane. This decoupling further increases resilience. So the, the data plane is really the part of the service that our customers depend on to run their applications. So this would be, for example, an EC2 instance running or a database being updated with data. The control plane is the administrative part of the service. Think of this as maybe deleting a database or creating a new machine. And we have other approaches here, like cellular architecture and shuffle sharding that I invite you to dig deeper into to be able to explain our approach on resilience. But I'll, I'll allow you to do that uh, outside of this. And we've also heard that customers want to iterate the way they think about resilience in their own cultures. So some of the approaches that we have in, in our culture is to start with a service ownership model. So we have small multidisciplinary teams with deep ownership, and they're responsible for launching the service all the way through to managing it in production. We also have operational readiness reviews, which think of these as a checklist before a service is launched to go through and look at resilience approaches as well as best practices. And then we have weekly operational review meetings to further improve our overall resilience posture. We implement safe continuous deployments by automating our continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline and have automated rollbacks. And we use stage deployments to deploy a change just to a single server first in one availability zone and then watch that for a while and deploy that to the rest of the availability zone and then across the entire region, all availability zones, and only then would we release that change to the broader set of, of regions in a, stag, a staged approach. And finally, we have a corrections VARES process. This is a way of getting at a root cause of a service issue. And this looks at, uh, it's, it's a blameless correction VARES process that looks to get to the bottom of what happened, but then also update our operational readiness review process once that's documented. And these typically kick off engineering sprints to confirm that that same type of issue isn't present in other AWS services and can be addressed if so. Now these are all aspects that we use, but you could also take home and potentially use in your own operations. Now, how can you plan for resilience on your side? Again, I mentioned the fault isolation boundary white paper. That's a great resource that you can use to um, identify different scenarios that you could test in your own environment and be able to explain to your regulators and different stakeholders. 
And I do recommend looking at the reliability pillar of the AWS well-architected framework and consider even baking that into your governance processes. I also recommend looking at the operational excellence and the security pillar as well. Because these really aggregate our AWS best practices together and allow you to, to build with confidence here. And finally, you can check these configurations with AWS Resilience Hub. This is where you define your RTOs and RPOs and your resilience objectives, and then profile your applications based on those to see how likely you are to meet your resilience requirements and objectives. And then the fault injection simulator is used to actually profile what happens if you experiment with a particular type of fault to see how resilient your applications are. But again, the most important part is to be able to explain your approach to your stakeholders and a wide variety of those at that. All right, so, so far we've covered three regulatory shifts. Samara talked about how regulations are becoming more cloud aware. She's talked about how there was an increased need for due diligence. And I just referred to a regulatory focus on operational resilience. I wanted to walk through an example that really touches upon all three of these themes and shows how this compliance flywheel works in practice. Now, as a little bit of background, the SEC has released broker-dealer record-keeping rules, and some form of this rule goes all the way back to the 1930s. In short, this rule aims to make sure that records are available to facilitate effective examination of broker-dealers and other entities in the security space. Now, in the 90s, the rule was updated because more and more broker-dealers wanted to use electronic storage media to store their records. And the requirements include concepts like immutability, meaning records can't be updated, modified, or deleted. They require a retention period to retain their records for a certain number of years. And they include uh, concepts like searchability and, and the ability to index records. And customers from the 90s on started buying on-prem storage devices to help meet these requirements. But as we know, the world changes, and we'll look at how a new release of the rule enabled this flywheel to spin around one more time. So again, this is our customer compliance flywheel. It starts with customer outcomes. So customers wanted to get more value out of their records. They wanted to use their records for things like machine learning and analytics, as well as maybe supporting customer calls when there are inbound customer support calls to the broker dealer. And so their first question was, how do we do this in the cloud? And the previous rule was really written for a period uh, where the broker-dealer owned the underlying infrastructure. So if you rem recall here, there were some feedback from customers that they wanted to do this type of workload in the cloud, but they didn't necessarily know if they could do it with the existing features. So we listened to that feedback, and we innovated on behalf of customers. And we released some features, like S3 with object lock, to help provide that immutability in the cloud. Customers had to do their due diligence on us. So we retained an external opinion to confirm or review how the, the uh, requirements are met with these features like S3 object lock. And then customers also did further due diligence on the durability of S3. So they referenced some of our SOC controls and understood how an object was written across a minimum of three availability zones before a success criteria is written back. And then compliance specialists like myself helped work with customers to bring these different uh, features and compliance reports and objectives all together to help them uh, enable this type of workload in the cloud. But the reality is that the world changes. And in November 2021, the SEC released a proposed update to the rule. 
And they, during that proposed update, they invited public comments from customers as well as the general public. And so AWS and other cloud service providers responded to that, that call for comments by helping describe the way that customers want to use the cloud for this type of workload, especially in this new cloud model where they don't necessarily own the underlying infrastructure, but they do retain ownership and control of their content. And so AWS and several customers and other cloud service providers submitted those comment letters by January 3rd in 2022. And the final rule that came out reflected that customers indeed do want to use the cloud for this type of workload. And it reflected the nature of the cloud, where customers retain independent ownership and control of their content. And so that compliance date was just last month. And now we have numerous customers leveraging AWS for this type of regulated workload. Now Samara started with the ever-present nature of change and we like to lean into change. We're gonna keep this compliance flywheel moving. And as Samara stated right at the beginning, it's still day one at AWS. And we will continue to evolve to help support customers with their regulated workload needs. Thank you very much.